What will the Knicks rotation look like this season? How will the cat trade affect how things work out? How will the newfound semi lack of depth pay off in terms of how the Knicks approach their rotations this year? We're talking about all that and more right now on Locked on Knicks. You are Locked on Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, welcome in to Locked On Knicks. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. You can start the season with a big return on FanDuel. Place your $5 bet, and you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. And I want to thank you guys for making Locked On Knicks your first listen today and every day, whether you're checking us out on your favorite podcast platform or taking in sights and sounds on YouTube. We appreciate you making us a part of your daily routine. Make sure you hit the notification bell on YouTube or the auto-download function on your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. We are here for you guys five whole days a week again, back in regular season form. The Knicks haven't even played their first, first preseason game yet, and yet here we are. Back in five day a week form. I'm Alex Wolf. I'm Aaron Chief and Nick Site the Strickland, which you can find at Strick.land. And he's Gavin Shaw, your favorite play by pair broadcaster's favorite play by pair broadcaster. And today, Gavin, we're breaking down the rotations. And uh, I, I feel like we don't need to um, uh, kind of tiptoe around it at all. We may as well just hop right in. Uh, I think that the most intriguing position, well, so first I'll introduce how we're going to do this. We're going to break down our regular season rotation, which is like what we think day one can or should be and then what we hope when push comes to shove that the playoff rotation becomes later mm -hmm. on in the season we're going to break it down by position groups so we're going to do centers first and then we're going to do wings and then we're going to do uh guards to end the show although you'll get to see spoilers of what our whole thing is when we flash the graphics that show our whole rotation but we'll discuss them in that order uh so gavin do you want to lead by just showing your rotation here and let's get right into the center position. Yeah, let's do it. All right. So I have um, Kat playing 34 minutes, Precious playing 14 minutes. I, I don't, I mean, like part of it is semantics, right? Like who's the center, who's the power forward. Like, I guess it depends on, on who's guarding who defensively. I, I think Tom Thibodeau is going to want to park Carl Anthony Towns as close to the rim on defense as humanly possible. And by default, he'll, he'll sort of be the center. So um, and, and I don't think like I, you, if, if you look at my power forward there, you'll see I precious getting six extra minutes at that position. I, I, I think it's that simple. I don't really see any need for Jericho Sims to be a part of the rotation at the start of the year. I, I think precious Achua playing 20 minutes and, and maybe as, as high as quite close to 30 minutes. If, if Landry Shamit is not in the rotation, which is a conversation we'll get into in a little bit. Um, I have no issue with precious Achua playing 20 minutes. I, I, I think he is going to thrive with Carl Anthony Towns. I think he might be the player that benefits the most from that. Instead of overtaxing him as a starting center, he gets to come in, crash the glass. He gets to be a pick and roll threat with Jalen Brunson because Cat can just be spacing off of that at all times. Defensively, they're going to use him um, to be really switchable in any two through four screens, given that you have Mikhail Bridges, Josh Hart, OG Ananobi playing the bulk of the minutes there. So to me, that, that that's the one where I think there's going to be the least debate. I, I don't really know how you could go any other way, but I'm, I'm curious to see if you did. Yeah, it is the it's just the en vogue position to discuss right now, given given current events. Uh, but I, I've I think I might actually have literally wait. Let me double check. I think I have the exact same. Yeah, yeah. I didn't copy your work. I promise. I was writing it independent of you. But uh, thirty four minutes for Cat for me, fourteen for Precious. I've also got Precious with six minutes hmm. uh, at the power forward spot, um, which you know I guess is the uh, I I think that's like the sweet spot. I think that you know. I don't know that you necessarily want to have those two, even if Precious ends up the starter. Um, I don't know that you would want him being a starting power forward, I should say. I don't I don't know that you want that pairing going for more than like 10 minutes a game. Matchup dependent, of course, you know, if you're facing some team that's just enormous across the board, then sure. But otherwise, I just think, you know, I think Josh Hart is going to give you good minutes. I think that you're, you're going to want to experiment with like OG at the nominal four with Cat out there uh quite a bit as well um you know where you have like mikhail bridges as your three and deuce mcbride as your two and then obviously brunson or campaign or whoever is your one you know i think that's worth looking into um and and something that the knicks should definitely be open to as like a it's not really small ball anymore you know like we were talking about small ball like a whole week ago 
which is crazy to think about that it was <laughs> it's been less than a week since this cat trade have been, actually it's been like less than 12 hours since it officially went down because mm -hmm. it just happened earlier today that that yeah. the deal was officially announced so maybe we can uh, close the show talking about just just building a shrine to Brock Aller and his one dollar over the veterans minimum uh, wizardry in that deal but you know I, I think that now it, when you talk about small ball it's kind of just going to be like how small do you want to go with the four for large swaths of the game because otherwise I think until Mitch comes back and you could talk about true jumbo ball I think the Knicks now are in a position where they're going to have a true center type guy out there at all times again kind of yeah. similar to the Hartenstein and Mitch dynamic except for this time it's going to be Cat and hopefully Mitch later on in the season um, and maybe some minutes between the two of those guys so um, but as of right now I, I I think just with the personnel the Knicks have there's not really much debate that Cat's going to be starting and playing a lot of minutes at center this year. Yeah, I, th I think that's pretty clear. And 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 the only like smallest thing you're going to have is if you, you don't really consider Precious a Chua center. I, I just think there are, we, we talked about this last year with all the injuries, there are very few backup centers that are going to punish Precious Achua and guys that are going to, are going to come in and you're going to say like, Hey, like throw him the ball, go at this guy. He's too small. His Precious is strong. He's long. He's, he's, he's going to be really good in terms of the pick and roll defense. So I'm really excited to see what type of season he has. Um, let, let's flip to the wings where, where there's not going to be a ton of debate between us, but there, there was sort of some internal debate for me. And that was how much Landry Shamit um, played. Uh, I, I initially did not have him in the rotation. I posted my, my first draft to uh, Twitter and a lot of people were like, come on, like it's not going to be an eight man rotation to start the year. And I sat with it. I sat with it. I was like, you know what? You're probably right. I wouldn't be shocked if night one against the Boston Celtics, Tom Thibodeau comes up and says like, F it, we're, we're trying to win this game. I'm playing my best guys. This is a playoff game. Josh, you're back out there 48 minutes, buddy. Let's go. Uh, you had the whole summer to rest. But um, I, I do think long term, it's probably more prudent to try to play a nine man rotation. So we, we, we had we can we can get into why I had OG listed as my power forward. You had Hart listed as your power forward. I think the difference there is you, I, I'm, I'm assuming, we didn't talk about this before, but you're probably saying Hart's going to play more like the nominal power forward on offense, which I would totally agree with. I'm saying OG is going to be the nominal power forward on defense, and that's just sort of how I structured it. I think as often as they can, the Knicks are just going to try to put him on a non-shooter and let him roam. And, and like if teams try to spam their 1-5 pick and roll against Brunson and Cat. They're going to try to have OG into a position where he can slide over and help while still recovering to the corner. Um, as DJ talked about a lot on the pod yesterday, I have Precious Achua also getting six minutes at the four, and I have Josh Hart split between the three and four, getting a total of 30 minutes. Mikhail Bridges, I have slotted as like kind of a 2-3. I thought it was prudent to just sort of smash those into one position because I don't really know, like, is it going to be Hart being the two? Is it going to be Mikhail being the two? Two through four, it's like all going to be a mismatch just depending on how you decide to define it. And Deuce McBride getting 22 minutes at the two guard. We've we've kind of heard over and over again over the summer, the Knicks don't really consider him a point guard. And, and we'll get into who could benefit from that, and who could play more from that. So I had the bulk of his minutes coming at the two, which also just makes a lot of sense when he's basically your your sixth best player and Jalen Brunson is obviously going to be out there for 30 plus minutes. Alex, I hit on a lot of stuff, maybe too much. Uh, what was interesting in that in that barrage to you? Um, so I kind of find myself in a similar, similar spot here. Um, so I had, you know, again, like you noted, I I categorized them slightly differently. So I had Hart at 32 minutes at my four spot and then OG at 22 at the three uh, and then OG with 10 minutes at the power forward. Like I, I do think it's going to be important for the Knicks to explore that a lot. Um, you know, having OG out there and having him be like, like without a heart out there, you know, like, and I think those would be the minutes where Hart is not playing um, where you have OG out there as like, indisputably the nominal four and that could come with precious too like i think that that would be a pretty good pairing like those two clearly seem to get each other last year you know because it, that chemistry from toronto obviously came over with them so they were able to you know kind of bring some of that right away um especially when you know it, well ironically they didn't get to show it as much as i would have liked but like the few moments they did get to share i thought were pretty good because mm -hmm. unfortunately like precious is like rise into becoming really good was after OG got hurt and after the Knicks were just like 
floundering with injuries and everything. That was when Precious really stepped up and did his thing. But I think that gives you an intriguing combo where like both those guys, if you have them at like the four or five, can handle the ball a little bit, like certainly more than your average four or five. So you could have, even if it's not the strongest shooting five man unit, uh, depending on who's out there with Precious at the five, you can have everybody just running around and everybody cutting, everybody going to the hoop. I think it could be a very fun style of basketball if it's like hard out there um along or even if it's not i was saying not hard but so if it's like og and precious and uh mikhail deuce and campaign or something like it's sort of a yeah. a little hybrid unit like i think that could be a lot of fun and open up a lot of different things um then as far as other you know wing minutes i i i went ahead and did the nominal positions i i, I kind of agree with you though it doesn't really matter between shooting guard and small forward um but i had Mikhail with 25 at the two guard, Deuce with 23 at the two guard, and minimal minutes at point guard. Um, then OG Ananobi with 22 at the small forward to give him 32 minutes total. Uh, Mikhail with 10 minutes at small forward, give him 35 minutes total. And then Landry Shaman with 16 minutes. So maybe that's maybe that's worth discussing uh, in the next segment, you know, where we kind of rank Shamit because you had him with a decent amount less minutes. Um, yeah, I think maybe. I'm kind of – yeah. Yeah, with eight, so like half of that. So I'm kind of the mind that he should be uh, utilized a little more, especially during the regular season, because I think he's a solid NBA player, solid NBA body that can go out there, shoot threes, and hopefully won't be a you know a player that would lead to you losing his minutes for any reason. You know, I think that he is just you know even if he's just an average whatever defender, he could spot up and shoot threes. So. I think we got I think we got the lead in for our next segment. So let's talk about Landry Shaman, the, the sort of, sort of forgotten man in just a moment. Um once we get back in. But first we want to tell you about our good friends over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Hey NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats for you live play by play and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. So here's where I would throw down those first $5. Uh, if you're watching Thursday morning tonight, it is Bucks, Falcons. The Falcons are one and a half point favorites. I think that is utterly ridiculous. The Bucks have been a far better team so far this season. Baker Mayfield is playing light years, light years, light years ahead of uh, Kirk Cousins, um, despite the Netflix documentary. Um, I, I like Tampa Bay's weapons better. I like the way their defense is flying around. They just added Sterling Shepard, who proved to be a really dynamic addition in his first game in a Bucks uniform. I think they come out there and kick some butt, and, and, and you're getting points to take the Buccaneers. So I am rolling with that. Again, that is $5 to have $200 in bonus bets guaranteed, all on FanDuel.com. All right, we are back on Locked On Knicks. It, it is officially time for the great Landry Shamit Summit. Alex, I hope this guy is a 20-year Nick and we, we get to do one of these every single year. Um, so I was, yeah, that's ambitious, but um, I, I was a little unsure about putting him in the rotation from the get-go. Uh, not that I dislike Shamit as a player, and, and clearly that was uh, that that was some foresight on the Knicks anticipating that they might 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 have to part with Dante Divincenzo and saying, "Hey, let's have someone who can shoot the basketball." Would love if, if Landry Shamit made a similar leap as Devo. Not going to give you the same defense. Not going to give you the same playmaking. Not nearly the same handle. Um, not quite the same shooter, but he is an elite shooter. Career thirty eight percent from distance, taking. Five threes per game. Last season was the worst shooting season of his career from distance. Um, only got up 3.4 threes per game. He's never shot less threes than that. Part of it was that he only played 16 minutes a game and only shot 34% from three. I am looking at partially as a, as a product of small sample size, given the limited minutes, and also the fact that he was on a terrible team in the Wizards, which meant the defense has got to pay a little bit more attention to him whenever he was on the floor. I think he could be useful, though, in some of these Knicks lineups, particularly in the configurations you're talking about. Um, where you're having heavy bench minutes with Mikael Bridges, with OG Ananobi. I would try to minimize the time he's on the floor with, with Brunson and Cat uh, to as little as possible. And I would almost never play all three of those guys together just because I, I think that's too many points to attack on defense. Um, but if you insulate him correctly, I, I think he could be really useful as a as a spacer off the bench and um, maybe someone who could open things up for Deuce McBride, who showed an improved ability to get to the rim to really attack. Same with Mikael Bridges, same with OG. Yeah, I think in looking at his numbers, like 
through his time, I, you know, again, I think you could kind of throw out last year, like, because the numbers with the Wizards are not particularly useful. Like, I had the same, <laughs> had the same thing come up on a, on in our comments section in YouTube recently, where someone was like, "Did he just say that that Mikhail Bridges was a DPOY candidate? Did you even watch last year?" I'm like, "Bro, I'm not going to take into account what he what someone did on a team with absolutely nothing to play for because that's just not a good scope through which to judge any player because they're obviously not going to be as locked in. So, I'm not too worried about the shooting dip last year. I think that in a better offense, which the Knicks will be, and with a defined role of basically just being the floor spacer, you know, hey, don't don't give up points actively on defense. I think he can probably do that. You know, he's traditionally, I mean, I know this was like four or five years ago now, but, you know, on the Suns teams that really were good, like the, the Chris Paul, Devin Booker teams, he, like, he managed to be – overall a positive even if not as positive as the starting lineup obviously like being like a bench player and whatever so you know he would be like a plus three and the team as a whole would be a plus seven you know so it would be like oh they, they were four points worse during his minutes it's like yeah but he wasn't like actively losing them minutes which is all you want to see you want to see a guy that can slot into a bench unit and be part of a good deep bench which you know, for all the I said it at the the open of the show, and you know, for all the the talk that's been done about rightfully that the Knicks just lost two heavy rotation players to get one back in the steal. Um, with all apologies to James Naji, who maybe will come over at some point. Um, but uh, you know, I, I think that they're still deep, and they, you know, to your point, they were they had the foresight to go get a guy like Shamit, who I think is not quite as good of a deal as say like uh like Gary Trent Jr on the Bucks or something on a minimum deal but all in all I think is a guy that is is definitely an NBA player and they they're pretty lucky to have along with campaign as those uh fee Knicks sons that they have on this team here um you know as their two minimum guys and maybe that's a good segue to kind of talk about the point guard minutes and bring this full circle a bit on the regular season stuff mm-hmm. because I think campaign probably has a stake for some minutes here too and i think that those two guys as the two you know vet men guys on the team would be the guys that i think will round out this rotation um in terms of making it a nine-man rotation until mitch gets back and then we'll see obviously what happens once mitch is back as far as how that works out minutes wise and whatever uh, i think they'll mostly harm precious if anything um but yeah i think that i think shaman and campaign both kind of have a stake for for playing time as long as they shoot well and and defend well enough to not cost this team points and potentially games then i think they'll have a role on this team yeah i'm with you all right let's let's talk point guard um certainly the most interesting of these debates um i my, my initial instinct similar to sham it was to to just have deuce mcbride play these minutes um maybe that would be overdoing it on on, on my list that would that would get him up to 35 minutes per game which would be a lot I just kind of think Deuce McBride is really good and I kind of want him on the floor as much as possible. And I've got, I got, I got kind of pushed back when I said that on Twitter and people were like, well, like Tom Thibodeau wants a true point guard. And, and look, I'm talking against myself in some ways, because if you remember uh, late last season, I was complaining every single game about how there'd be like three or four possessions a game when Deuce McBride were in, where you would just start initiating offense with eight seconds left on the shot clock. And, he just wasn't quite good enough at, at just being a backup point guard. I, I thought he showed signs of improvement in the playoffs. I think his handle has gotten dramatically better to the point that you just saw him drop people a couple different times. It was more so like the mental side of being a point guard that he had trouble with. I think having a full offseason to prepare for playing some minutes there could potentially make a difference. So there's a world where Shamit's playing more minutes and, 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 and Deuce is getting a little bit more run at the point guard position than some people think. That being said, they probably don't invest in both campaign and Tyler Kolek if they weren't planning on, on playing one of those two guys. I think it's going to be campaign to start the year. And I do think it'll make a difference for the Knicks having someone who's been a point guard his entire career, who's, who we've seen can be kind of a pain in the butt um, from when we played the Sixers. But I do wonder if over time, Tyler Kolek potentially overtakes him and we've kind of seen that pattern with Tom Thibodeau in the past I always think about Quinn Grimes not really getting a chance until that I was was it the Christmas game his rookie year where he dropped like 30 points out of nowhere and then all of a sudden he was he was he was sort of in the back end of the rotation you really have to earn it as a rookie for Tom Thibodeau I I would guess campaign at some level of guarantee of like hey like those those minutes are yours if you're here I think you and I were a little off in terms of how much he's playing and and I, I I think Tibbs at a certain point 
will try to limit him just because the defense is going to be too destructive next to some other guys. And you're going to be really, really small between him and Deuce. But I, I'm curious what that balance is between playing a little bit too small versus having more ball handling and more initiation on the floor. Yeah, I, I came in similar. I think I, I have Deuce just playing a little less of like pure point guard minutes. Um, so I have Deuce at 23 minutes at the shooting guard spot and only three minutes at the point guard spot. Maybe it's slightly more than that. Uh, but I think that I, I just feel like Tibbs is going to want a, a slightly more steady hand out there. And I'm I'm not saying that to like crap on Deuce or anything. Like I think that he can sustain something out there as like the nominal point guard. But I just think he's better if he can play off ball, if I'm honest. Like I think that his greatest skill is spot up shooting from three. I think that. You know, he's really, really, really good at that, other than the defense, of course. But, like, his greatest offensive skill is spot-up shooting from three. We saw that, you know, take hold in the playoffs. We saw that at various times last year when, you know, Brunson was one of the guys that was mostly healthy during all the injury woes. So when Deuce had to play tons of minutes, he had to play them next to Brunson. And I think that's going to be largely the plan this year, too. Um, you know, maybe some of those minutes are spent with campaign as well, but I don't think that, I think that Deuce makes, I mean, it's sort of a similar vibe, right? To if Deuce could work with Brunson, then why couldn't he work with campaign? You know, I, I don't campaign obviously isn't the scorer that Brunson is. Um, but he's a guy that can initiate and kick out to open shooters, which perfectly encapsulates Deuce McBride. And then defensively, like, again, if it works with Brunson, it should be able to work with campaign as long as he's not uh, just completely, you know, crap in the bed out there and you can still keep you know one of mikhail or og out there with them uh which will be super useful precious isn't really a slouch defensively either is very switchy whatever um you know so i think you've got you've got some options you know to make this whole thing work um and and get campaign some minutes and i i think he's gonna be good i i'm kind of with you on the colic thing you know i i think maybe he'll stake a claim once or twice but i i think short of some longer term injuries. I don't know if he'll ever quite get enough of an opportunity to like really audition in earnest for more minutes. Um, and as a result, he'll probably play pretty sparingly throughout the year, but I'm rooting for him. Like I certainly can see the long-term vision with Colic more than I can see it uh, with campaign. But I do think that like Colic is going to need to be able to prove that he can do a little more off the ball. I think uh, whereas right now it seems like it's more, that he needs the ball in his hands. Maybe that's a selling point if he's just directly shadowing Jalen Brunson's minutes and never actually plays with Brunson. But like I could see a world where a campaign could play with Brunson for a couple yeah. minutes if they needed him to. And that's I don't really see that as much with Kolek at the moment. Um, but Gavin, eventually this team, you know, we can take away all the health qualifiers, hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, and potentially have a playoff rotation that would be healthy, which mostly just means the inclusion of Mitchell Robinson. Uh, so let's come back in just a second and talk about what Mitch's addition would mean and also just the uptick that we would potentially see that could potentially rule some of these guys out a little bit or, or at least result in less minutes come playoff time. All right, we're back in. Keep talking through these rotations. And Gavin, uh, we've made it to the playoff section. So we've we've talked through each position uh, and what we think guys should be doing during the regular season, which, uh, or at least in the early parts of the regular season, which did not include Mitch. And so let's just assume a world where Mitch comes back. And we're calling this our playoff rotation. Hopefully that means that everybody would be healthy come playoff time. Uh, but we could also just as easily call it the if Mitch is healthy rotation mm. um, with something to play for, i.e. playoffs. Um, so uh, I'll let you lead off again. Uh, what What's kind of different about this one versus your regular season rotation? It, it's pretty similar. It's basically just Mitch taking over the precious at center minutes, Cat playing a little bit at the four. I Cat at six at the four. There might be like when you get into like game five, six, seven territory, there might be nights where Cat six at the four is like, a 10 at the four and, and Mitch is maybe playing two extra minutes at center and you're, you're, you're only playing seven guys and that's totally plausible to me. But I, I think the, the biggest note I'll have here is that, well, I mean, obviously everyone's minutes gets bumped up. Brunson goes from 35 to 40. Mikhail goes from like 34, 35 to 37. Hart goes from 32 to 35. OG goes from uh, whatever I had him at 30 or 32 to 36. Cat goes from 34 to 36. Maybe, maybe that's even a little bit short for cat. 
Um, I, I think the main thing I want to get across here is I think at this point in his career, I have Mitchell Robinson as an 18 minute per game guy in the playoffs. And I think if your goal is to win an NBA championship and your goal is to get Mitchell Robinson across that finish line, um, you, you cannot overplay him. And and there will be games where where this is where Mitch's health is such a big concern. And I, you, you might have talked about this with Ben. I didn't discuss it on any of the cat pods I've been on. Um, he fouls a lot. Like for, for anyone who hasn't watched a lot of Western Conference basketball, he commits really stupid, mind-numbing fouls in the playoffs. And you will see games in the postseason where he plays 24 minutes because he somehow got to six fouls. And because of that, you need to do everything humanly possible to preserve Mitchell Robinson. I You know, put him in a... In a, a what is it? A, a cryogenic? I can't think of the word. I cryogenic. Cryogenic. There we go. Thanks, Alex. Um, mm-hmm. A cryogenic tank. Arizona State Education over here. Um, <laughs> when when he's not um, on the floor, and and just just save the guy because they are going to need his defense. They're going to need his rebounding. And and again, there'll be games where he's going to have to play like eighteen of the final twenty four minutes. So I, I think you're doing all you possibly can to get him to that point. Yeah, I I, I kind of come down in a similar spot. Again, I I did not copy your your math here but i think i came to the exact same That's conclusion yeah. uh cat with 30 minutes mitch with 18 uh cat also with six at the four i would love to see those two play some minutes together i don't know how many uh exactly you would want them to be playing together um you know, I, I think that's that's gonna be interesting to see play out once Mitch comes back, assuming that Mitch is still a nick by the time he's healthy, which you know they again I feel like we should bring up you know there's been rumors that he might be on the trade block um you know so if that comes to pass then obviously that's all moot and we'll have to start talking about some other player and how they fit with cat potentially but um you know he's cleared one hurdle at least and not being part of the cat trade or being sent to charlotte or something in exchange for like nick richards or something like that so that's that's thing one i guess um but you know i think i think playing those two together is sort of like playing cat and precious together like it's just sort of get a little yin and yang there. You get to play, you know, a more traditional four or five arrangement. And obviously it's worth looking at, like I talked about this with Ben, like it's worth looking at, you know, having Mitch and Kat together because Kat and Rudy Gobert, surprisingly, yeah, uh, proving the haters, namely me and many others wrong. No, actually most worked most out people cool. who watch the NBA. To be yeah. Honest. I mean, I don't think too many people thought that was going to work out and it worked out quite well. And it kind of mm-hmm. accentuated some of the things Kat can do well on defense, which is, namely just not being in a position to potentially foul, like you said, you know, and, and be stranded under the rim and whatever. So that might be something that they even explore more than just having Cat out there for six minutes um, at the four. So I might even be underscoring that. But yeah, then I had, I guess my only big difference here is I had Mikhail's minutes going up to 37. I had Brunson up to 40. Um, do still at like 23 to 25, which maybe that would cut into Shamit a little bit. I still had Shamit at 12 minutes. I guess I'm a big Landry Shamit believer. Um, but I, I don't have OG's minutes going up a ton in the playoffs. And I do think that that might be something that they will be cognizant of this year, given how things went last year, where like he played a reasonable amount of minutes for most of the playoffs. And then boom, the one game that he had to play, like whatever it was like 40, 40 plus minutes or whatever, he strains the hamstring. And, you know, I I feel like they might be a little cognizant of that this year, especially with Mikhail there too, that they can like, if they're up against like a Tyrese Maxey type player, which granted the OG on Maxey experiment didn't work anyway, but just as an example, if they're up against some, you know, dynamo on the other side, Paul George, let's say now at this point, that's like the guy that you would want to keep OG on if this was last Mm -hmm. year's Knicks. Now you have a Mikhail Bridges who you could be like, all right, let's give OG like an extra five minutes to rest and make sure that he's loose and whatever, and then nothing bad is going to happen. And then we can throw him back out there and we can put that two man wrecking crew out there, you know, for longer. But obviously, Mikhail Bridges has the Iron Man rep, rightfully, he hasn't missed a game since like high school. Um, so, and who knows what that was for? He might have had detention or something. Like, there's not, there's no way to know if that was legitimate or not. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it I think that you're in a good position now where you can afford to keep OG's minutes at more of a regular season level, even once you hit the postseason, because I, I do think that he is mega, mega important to, and that's why he's up until this cat trade went through, he was the highest paid Nick of all time um, because 
you know, you really need the contributions that he's going to give you um, because the, he's he's so key to what this team can potentially do on defense and even on offense to a degree with the three point shooting. Yeah, I'm I'm with you. I, I think as much as you can, you keep him down. I think in later rounds, so there'll be a point where you're like, he might get hurt, but we're just not going to win if he's not on the floor for close to 40 minutes and we you have to risk it. Um, but I, I do think it's, it's it's a distinction worth noting. You had both Shamit and Payne in your playoff rotation. I had neither of them. I think the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. And one of those two guys plays like at least past the first, like if, if the Knicks, let's just say race to the one seed and get an easy first round opponent, then sure. I could see both those guys out there. Um, I think second, third, and and hopefully fourth rounds. I, I have a feeling you're, you're going to see maybe only one of them play. And then later on, neither of them play. I would lean into playing Deuce. So I've, I'm at 24 minutes here. I, I don't know what um, I can I can pull up yours. You had him at uh, 23, so that wasn't a big difference. I'm, I'm I'm trying to see. I think the biggest difference we had was was OG pretty much, um, or maybe one of us just did our math wrong. It's possible I did. But uh, that point aside, um, I don't want campaign out there and Landry Shaman out there just because I think they will be relentlessly targeted, and you're already gonna have to spend the bulk of your time stopping uh, Jalen Brunson and Carl Anthony Towns from being relentlessly targeted. Again, it depends on which team you're playing. There are only so many that actually have the depth to take advantage of those weak points for the Knicks, but I could see Tom Thibodeau kind of easing back the throttle on those guys, or kind of like we saw with the Sixers last year, using them situationally, where it's like campaign and Buddy Hill, depending on who was hot on a given night. Yeah, I guess I, like, I, I think we've seen with campaign that, you know, he can do it in the postseason. I mean, he just did it to the Knicks this past year. So I mostly just look for like guys that, you know, if it, I could see them still being part of him and Shamit as well, still being part of the rotation just because they're not really playoff droppers, which is good. So like, if you look at Shamit's numbers in the postseason too, like, I mean, the field goal percentage overall is never pretty, like super pretty with him, but like the three point percentage doesn't really drop too much considering, you know, he's going into the postseason and he's played, for a number of teams and played like 15 minutes a game in the postseason. So, you know, I, I think maybe I, maybe I overestimate I think I put him in like 12 minutes, you know, like let me just double check. Yeah. 12, you know, maybe that's overestimating it a little bit, but I could see him still having a role. You know, all it takes is like one guy being, you know, a little in foul trouble or something like Josh Hart picks up a couple of early fouls or something. And suddenly mm -hmm. you need another body out there. I would probably, I would feel comfortable throwing Shaman out there in a playoff game. If it meant like not, overtaxing Mikel Bridges or uh, OG Ananobi or Deuce or I mean I Deuce probably wouldn't be maybe Deuce is really the guy that would just step in in any scenario like that because you would just shift people either up or down in position to accommodate yeah. that but yeah I can see a world where Shamit still contributes I mean I just think I think they're going to need him during the regular season to keep the minutes under control for everybody else and just keep running that nine-man rotation I, I think there's a world where Tibbs could expand to a 10 man rotation. And as long as he's learned from his past mistakes, make that work. You know, if he's more okay with like keeping guys shuffling around a little more than, than he has in the past when he used to just treat it like two separate five man units that would have to be there basically all at once. Mm -hmm. um, so if he's willing to do that, I could see Shamit carving out a role that way and then eventually becoming a guy that contributes in the postseason uh, yeah. just because you can never have too much shooting. And, you know, I think it's, if they if the Knicks came out like cold in one game and were like we need to spice something up, I could see Shamit being a guy that you caught. Same with the campaign being the guy, sort of like what they did, what the Sixers did with campaign being like, hey, get off the bench, get in there, go make a couple shots. Like we need something different. Something's not working here, so we need a new wrinkle. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I guess we'll see how it all plays out. It's all part of the fun of an 82 game season, and we haven't even gotten the preseason yet, and here we are pontificating about it. So I think now's the time where we just shut up and let them get to preseason sooner than later so we could start seeing this stuff on the floor. Uh, real real quick, Alex, before we go out, I just want to throw this out there. Dark horse names for, for a 10th man, if that happens. Uh, Kevin McCullough Jr., Chuma KK. Uh, not 100% that Chuma is going to make the team yet, but his defense, his length, I, I think it, it would just help to have one more bigger body on the wings that they were comfortable playing. I think that would do wonders for Tom Thibodeau. Kevin McCullough Jr., three and D guy um, defense fell off a little bit his final year at Kansas. But before that Prez came on and talked about this um, over the summer, he was considered like 
an elite, elite, elite college defender and a, and a very solid NBA defensive prospect. So if he's fully healthy, if his shooting's on point, if his defense is on point, I could see him later in the year, particularly if there's an injury, like you, you kind of almost have to like pencil in that OG Ananobi's going to miss 20 games somewhere. I could see one of those two guys sneaking in and, and playing some time. Yeah, if I was going to throw out my sleepers, I would probably say the two rookies, uh, or other than Kevin McCuller, and other than Ariel Huck Porty. I forget. It's really nice having four whole rookies on the team. The other two rookies, other than those two guys, oh. Dottie and Kolek. Hmm. Um, Kolek, I think, you know, it just comes down to if he gets an opportunity and he outplays campaign, I don't think they'd have any, they're not attached to the hip campaign in any way. It's not like they have to pay him any decent amount of money or whatever. Like, I, they're probably arguably more invested not even arguably they're more invested in tyler colic so if he's playing well and they think that he's gonna give them a better chance to win and whatever and it makes campaign unhappy they don't really care i don't think <laughs> so you know that that'll just come down to if he outplays him he outplays him and he'll he'll eventually take campaign spot then dadier like i really doubt it this is i'm, I'm putting this at like a two percent chance that he finds rotation minutes this year and that might even be generous but all it'll take, like if he comes out and he's hitting threes, like he's shot a million NBA range threes over the summer and now can hit them, which he couldn't do during summer league because he just clearly was too used to the the Euro three point line. But if he comes out and starts hitting those and can play pretty good defense, which he that he did do during summer league, I was pretty impressed with his defensive chops there. Maybe he finds himself a little bit of a role, especially like you said, in those scenarios where like an OG Ananobi is out for you know, some games or whatever, or if Josh Hart has to miss a couple games or whatever the case may be, where some of your like wings, your bigger wings uh, need to be out for a little bit. Maybe that's where Dottie gets the call of like, Hey, you know, we're going to, we're going to give you a shot like this. Uh, you know, we may as well, it's, you know, game 43 or whatever. Like it doesn't, it doesn't ultimately matter if we win this game or lose this game. Like we need to see what you got because you've been practicing well and whatever. And if he comes out there and makes some shots and stuff, maybe he stakes a claim for himself. So I guess we'll see. But Gavin, uh, I think I, I, I think we've we've talked enough about things that we have not seen play out at all. The Knicks are practicing now. Things are happening. Carl Anthony Towns can join the team officially. Jalen Brunson hopefully knows his name now uh, after media day when he said Carl who? Uh, hopefully he knows who, who Carl is now. And they start working beautifully together in practice and uh, find some chemistry going into the first preseason game. So. We'll have you posted on that. More player previews as we work our way up to the regular season. Uh, and, of course, any breaking news we'll have you covered for as well. But until next time, thank you all for listening, and we'll talk to you soon. Peace out, everybody.